music has many purposes. A march takes us to war, a lullaby puts us to sleep. It helps us back away from whatever is plaguing us. That's the power of music. Hello, one and all. I am glad you are with us today. My name is Andrew Racinos, and I am the president of the Tessitura Network, a nonprofit technology service and community company with a simple mission to advance the business of arts and culture. My guest today is Howard Herring, president and CEO of the New World Symphony, America's Orchestral Academy, a three-year postgraduate fellowship program for aspiring classical musicians and leaders. Howard is a native of Oklahoma and a pianist by training and has been the leader of the New World Symphony since 2001. During that time, Howard has worked side by side with artistic director Michael Tilson Thomas as they have continued to energize the symphony's national and international profile. Howard led the effort to develop the Frank Gehry designed New World Center, which opened in Miami to international acclaim in 2011. Now, when the COVID crisis began a few months ago, one of the very first people I wanted to chat with was Howard. And to give a little more background on why I wanted to talk to Howard so much in that moment, I need to reference a book that I am very fond of. This book called Switch explores the science behind how to drive meaningful change in human and organizational behavior. It's a great read if you're trying to influence change at an organization. And like it or not, the COVID crisis has required every one of us to make sudden, jarring, uncomfortable change. Changes that can be paralyzing. Now in Switch, the authors suggest a devilishly simple technique to finding your way through a huge change. They call this technique, find the bright spots. So the idea is rather than focusing on what's going wrong, look out into the world and find examples of things that are going right the bright spots and try to learn from those and replicate them. Which brings me back to the New World Symphony. Within a week of the COVID crisis, nearly every cultural institution on the planet was quote unquote pivoting to digital at breakneck speed. For many, digital had not been a primary focus in the past and making this pivot or making this change was nearly paralyzing. Well, to help us all pass that paralysis, we need to look for the bright spots. And the New World Symphony is a bright spot. You see, they didn't have to pivot to go to digital. They were already there. They've had a focus on digital delivery, not for five years, not for 10 years, but for nearly 20 years. That's right. The New World Symphony was a trailblazer around digital delivery of music long before Facebook Live, long before YouTube or Vimeo was a glimmer in any venture capitalist's eye. They are truly a bright spot for arts and culture right now, and I can't wait for you to hear more about what they're up to. So now, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Howard Herring, President and CEO of the New World Symphony. Howard. Andrew, good to see you. Good to be here. Yeah, good to see you too. Thank you for being here. You know, I, I really gave short shrift to my introduction about who the New World Symphony is, so I, I wondered if maybe you could just start by by singing a few bars and telling us a little bit more about, about your orchestra. Yes, for sure. So the New World Symphony, we just finished our 32nd year. This was an idea of Michael Tilson Thomas. Um, there was a particular moment at Tanglewood when he was a young man and he was finishing the Tanglewood summer and everyone began to talk about where they might be going over the coming season and many of them without orchestral positions, thinking about how they would freelance their way through yet another fall, winter, and spring. And it occurred to him that there might be a better way. There might be a way to prepare musicians beyond their formal training and yet in front of their professional engagement. And that would be a chance for them to find their own voice, to begin to train as leaders. And he imagined uh, this orchestral academy. Of course, his, his long-term goal was to create independent thinkers, musicians who really could could have something to say as musicians and as members of a community. So 
so that's the origin of the New World Symphony, people thinking, Michael thinking, let's see if this works. And in fact, here we are 32 year, years later, and, and it has. Um, briefly, there are 87 fellows in the fellowship. They come for three years. They can leave if they if they get themselves a job. Many of them do. The average time is about two and a half years uh, with us. Um, there are about 1,200 applications for 30 openings in each new year. We lose about a third of the players, so it's a it's a uh, incredible push to, uh, to for players to come to the New World Symphony. There are now 1,150 alums. That 90% of them are are involved in music making, and we think that's um, a testament to the idea that we're choosing well and they are gaining experience and going on to be um, very much part of the world around them. We started out as an academy. We think of ourselves now as a laboratory mm. for generating new ideas about the way music is taught and presented and experienced. Well, that's fantastic. So it was really a, a bridge almost from from traditional training out, out into the, the the real, the quote unquote real world of, of orchestral music. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, I will say the first time that I heard of the New World Symphony was about 20 years ago. And I was uh, a young IT guy working at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And being an IT guy, uh, word got around that there was this uh, there was this crazy thing that was happening up at the Manhattan School of Music. There was going to be this demonstration of a, of a hot new technology called Internet 2 or Internet 2.0. And uh, so a bunch of us got got on the subway and went up to, to upper upper Manhattan and crowded into a rehearsal room at the at the Manhattan School of Music where there was a student orchestra there and a student conductor and there was this huge screen in the back. They fired up the computer and all of a sudden Michael Tilson Thomas appeared on that screen um, using the internet. It wasn't over. It, this was not through broad. This wasn't through the airwaves. This wasn't broadcast. This was through the internet which in 2001, I think, which is when this was, was unbelievable. Like even, even us at, at Carnegie, and we thought we knew everything, we were amazed. And, and he was there, he was talking to the orchestra. At one point, he lifted his arms and he conducted the orchestra from thousands of miles away. And this is when I learned what the New World Symphony was. And I learned that the New World Symphony was all about being on a cutting edge of digital transmission of music. Um, and I. I guess I wouldn't have expected that. I, I totally understand your your mission to be that bridge between sort of the academic learning and going to an orchestra. But how did the New World Symphony also become such a path, um, a trailblazer in the digital realm? Well, that tracks back to Michael as well. In his uh, 20s, um, he was working with Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein gave him the responsibility of conducting and presenting the last few years of the New York Philharmonic's Young People's Concerts. So even at that young age, he began to understand the power of electronic transmission, both for telling the stories, the contextualization of the music, but also for reaching beyond a particular concert hall. If you move forward, um, he was the creator of Keeping Score with the San Francisco Symphony, an amazing series of videos that first of all, contextualize and then prepare you with that context for the performance that follows. He was the guy who thought up the YouTube symphony back in 2009 and 2011, uh, millions of people around the, around the world listening to an orchestra play, uh, an amazing phenomenon. It also tracks to Ted Arison, who was our philanthropic founder. Ted and Michael uh, came together in 1987 and had a conversation about the, the Michael's idea and Ted's desire to have more music in Miami. Ted was the founder of Carnival Corporation, but an enormous music lover. Mm -hmm. And so when the organization came together and they started playing concerts in the renovated movie theater that was the Lincoln Theater, right there on Lincoln Road Mall, a, a pedestrian mall in, in Miami Beach, Ted said, let's put a, a speakers and a, and, a, and a monitor on the door above the, the box office. So that's what we did. So television, television and speakers in a very modest way uh, right there so the people who are walking the road could really begin to understand what was going on inside. And all of that tracks to our vision statement. We say that we see a strong and secure future for classical music and that we will reimagine, reaffirm, and ex express and share its traditions with as many people as possible. 
That's the operative phrase. And of course, digital takes you out into a global circumstance. I mean, it's just amazing to think about um, and that, that makes that makes such perfect sense. And I'd forgotten about the YouTube Symphony until you mentioned it. I know that um, at the San Francisco Symphony, Michael Tilson Thomas brought brought out um, the sound box, right? Uh, uh, incredible space. Um, so this is something that had really been woven into the DNA of the New World Symphony almost from the beginning. And now it, it makes more sense now to think that that Tilson Thomas began. Um, with TV, I know that, that his family has had a background in, in theater and, and in, in media as well. Um, and, and the sort of the democratization, perhaps, of, uh, of, of the art form, something obviously that was very close to Bernstein's heart as well. So now fast forward to today and COVID and, and the, the in-person sitting next to each other, um, crowded into a theater suddenly is, is something that, that no one is able to do and won't be able to do for some time. Um, how has the New World Symphony reacted to that? And, and what can others in the cultural realm, whether performing arts or, or otherwise, learn from all of your years of doing this, successes, failures, learnings, adaptations? Sure, it's an enormous question. Um, <laughs> let me begin, uh, you ask it uh, in a particularly particular way that leads me to this thought. We have, some very sophisticated equipment here at the New World Symphony. We have 4K cameras for the capture of our concerts. We have 4K projectors in our park so that the wall casts are, are being put forward on a 7,000 square foot wall. We have a 167 speaker Meyer Constellation speaker system. It is a three-dimensional. You can feel, the, you can close your eyes and you can feel the ceiling and the walls of what is this imaginary concert space. Um, it, it is sophisticated. But you can do a lot of good with an iPhone, a camera and a microphone in an iPhone. And what we've discovered, we have a, a particular project here that our musician advancement group has put together. We call them Blue Projects. It has to do with how you apply your entrepreneurial skills as a fellow, apply those skills in the larger world, the community of Miami, uh, but beyond now, thanks to the Internet. And sometimes our guys are just using their iPhone. Uh, and and causing things to come together both educationally and in terms of concert presentation so don't let yourself be held back thinking oh my god i got to have all these cameras and those cameras don't are, are so expensive mm -hmm. um i would also say that it's in, what we've learned is that there are certain uh there are certain absolutes uh, or guiding principles you might say in this world of online learning and also online uh, online presentation. So the first is the power of dialogue. The, this is no longer one to many broadcast transmission. That very often people continue to apply the sensibilities of broadcast to the internet, but you're kind of wasting your time. Dialogue is what this is all about. I'll give you a good example. So um, composers, we have a lot of composers, who, who living composers who, whose music we play over the course of a year. Um, in fact, in this coming year, I think we're going to get to this topic later, that we'll have 25 living composers who are of color and or women. And that's just what's been programmed to date. There'll be a second round of programming when the fellows arrive because they have responsibility uh, for their own programs over the course of the year. All of those composers, whether it's 30 or 40 composers, they will come to us and they'll talk to the fellows in rehearsal and they'll talk to the audience in concert and it will be this evolving form of conversation that will affect both sides. If you go back and think about composers, uh, middle 1700s, um, they wrote for, take Bach for example, right? He wrote for a church and he knew his congregation. That was a, a small circle of people who knew him and he knew them and he was writing for them in an acoustical space. That's no longer the case. We have gone beyond that with digital technology, but I believe that we will form communities around the composer, audience, musician conversation in this particular new world that is digital access. The second piece that we uh, that we feel is important is context. You, this is a this is a medium that invites you to tell a story before you play, and we spend a lot of time doing that. Keeping score is a perfect model 
Michael understood that if you gave people enough information, they could be further transformed by the performances to follow. We, we follow that model all the time and are building out that model. The next piece has to do with access and reach. We're just a little old New World Symphony. But three times we have been on a global webcast and we have attracted over 100,000 people for the live edition of that webcast. The average watch time was 45 minutes. So people will come to it. People will stay over the course of the concert. These were two hour, two hour presentations. That's something that is really important. Half of that 100,000 was from the United States, half from the rest of the globe. The last part that is pr most intriguing to me is interaction. If you leave a performance at the New World Symphony as an audience member and you go to the lobby, you're going to encounter a fellow. A number of our fellows flood the atrium at the end of the performance. The conversations begin. Um, it's a really vital part of who we are and what we do. Online, it's a different story. And how we begin to interact with each other, you know, now you can type in questions or you can type in your responses. You can also sit you know, Facebook Live and you can hit the little bubble and it'll, it'll froth mm -hmm. up the side of the screen. That's primitive, right? We're going to get beyond that. But we have to, and I'm talking to New World now, but all of us on this call, we have to go out there and find out what this interaction is because it's going to be powerful. Mm -hmm. That's uh, I, I love all four of those. You know, the, the beginning and the end really tie together so well. Um, the interaction and, and also, you know, when you talk about Bach and the, you know, the fact that he was writing for his church, or you think about, you know, Chopin or Schubert who were writing for the salon, right? You know, 30 or 40 people um, swooning on couches, <laughs> however you want to think of it. Um, that's, that's where classical music be, began. You're right. And it, it's there's an irony in the fact that this that this pandemic that has forced us away from each other uh, is is has the potential to bring us together in new ways um, digitally. Yes. You know, when, when you think about the, the primitive, the hearts and the likes um, I've been watching. Uh, I know you're going to talk. Hopefully you're going to talk a little bit about live from the living room. I've been watching those uh, on, on Facebook and I just. I love, and, I, and I've seen others, Austin Opera and others are doing these Facebook live live performances and watching that interaction happening, watching the hearts floating up. Um, I've heard pop artists talk about how Instagram Live is actually a much more satisfying performance than a live performance because that you can actually interact. You know, it'd be very disruptive to interact with a, <laughs> with a violinist while they're performing uh, if you were sitting in front of them. But digital provides us this ability to kind of have the best, best of both worlds. Um, and I love the context, you know, understanding music is sometimes half, half of it, especially um, perhaps more contemporary music that people are hearing for the first time. With the, with the 25 composers, are you, are you planning post, you know, pre, during, after conversations online? Is that part of the yeah, idea? So, so every composer whose music we play, every living composer, they make a statement, sometimes live and sometimes videotaped. Uh, they make a statement before their piece is, is presented. What's always fascinating to me is that our audience, and we have a, a pretty amazing new music audience and across our entire audience, they expect that. They want to hear what's on the composer's mind, and yet they're always surprised by the direct emotional, intellectual commitment and connectivity that, that underpins this music and so when they come to it and hear it for the first time they can hear the voice of the composer laying it out there and saying what inspired them and how they how they conceived of the piece so we always have that we have yet to go to a lot of post concert interaction but that's there to be explored because that can make even more difference long term yeah i just i love the idea of the context to enrich the experience and and whether it's music whether it's um museums, what, I sometimes think about uh, if, if you've ever done one of these uh, chef's tasting menu things where the chef will come out and tell you exactly how they made the thing before you eat it, and it always tastes better when, when, you, when you know exactly what went into it, right? <laughs> so we did a, we did a project uh, four years ago. We call, it's called I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Mm -hmm. One of our fellows had the idea that she read a study that said that what your what you understand about wine 
and the kind of wine you are drinking makes a difference as to how you hear music. So, <laughs> right, just, we decided we would test that. And we rebuilt the theater so that every other row was a tasting bench. <laughs> We only got about 350 people in our 750 seat space, but it was well worth it. We had a sommelier and our our fellow, and the two of them talked about the music and the wine that was about to come to each uh, of the of the ticket purchasers, the members members of the audience, and we would very carefully go around and pour everybody uh, a tasting. Uh, of each of these wines, there were five wines and five pieces of music. So we didn't actually do the contrast. We didn't do same wine, two different pieces of music, but we were still having a good time. Yeah. And people remember that so vividly. Our audience was so enthusiastic about that. If we weren't a laboratory, I suppose we'd keep doing it. We'd do it once a year, yeah. but we're model builders, so we keep moving. Right. right. Well, then I have to ask, since you mentioned wine, um, one of the things that I've been so fascinated with, and I think people can learn from innovators like you, is what organizations are doing to create new experiences at a time where we can't all be together. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about an experience that was an on-site experience that has now become a virtual experience that I think is a close cousin of wine, but this is more about beer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's let's start at a relatively high level of abstraction. We believe at the New World Symphony that, we use the word concert, but we use it less and less. We talk about experience instead. Now that may seem cliche to a lot of people, but it's real here. There are multiple experiences, and in each of those New World experiences, classical music sits at the center. No compromise to the repertoire, excellent performances, but the experience is based on the audience you're trying to draw. So if you want to bring yoga students, then you ask people to come for 30 minutes of music and then a yoga session. We've had 500 people in the park on their yoga mats after a concert. So there's there are a lot of ways to, to pair people's day-to-day -day lifestyle desires with a particular concert. So this, first of all, you identify the audience, then you build the experience, then you put the music inside, you sell it because you've got to sell it not as a concert, but as an experience. You work hard to understand what happened to the audience during the experience, and you do that by talking with them and surveying them. You stop and reflect, you listen to what they've said, you reconfigure, and you do it again. So that's uh, the nature of, of some of our work. <laughs> We have a really wonderful uh, brewery here in Miami, Bezasur, and Bezasur is always looking for a new challenge. We came, we came to them a year ago. We've done two of these now. We call it Beer and Brass. Uh, many people on this call are really quite aware that brass players uh, do indeed have a beer from time to time. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure the brass players are all standing and cheering now. The idea was for and they have a, the marketing gentleman at at uh, at uh, Bezasur is articulate and inventive. Um, he's a stand-up comedian who brews beer, so he comes along and describes the beer, and our players then play a piece of music that is tangential sometimes, but but there is a relationship between the nature of the beer and the nature of the music. So we did it last year live in in person, but this year we had to go virtual. So it was a si simple deal for $25. You managed to, we delivered, Bezosur delivered to your home four beers. There were four pieces of music. Everybody was still the same. Our, their marketing, uh, their marketing manager was there describing the beer. Our guys were talking about the music and then they would play. We did quite a beautiful job. We sold a lot of tickets. We made a lot of people happy and Bezosur expanded its audience, as did we. So yes, you can do things online that are similar to what you were doing before, um, but you're just in the little thumbnail that is the box to where we find ourselves right this minute. Mm -hmm. You have to work to get through it, out, beyond it, but it can be done. I mean, I just, the, the word that keeps coming back into my head is essence. You know, you've, you've talked a couple of times now about the essence of the music or the essence of the experience. You know, when we talked about digital even, you said, yes, 
it's great if you've got millions of dollars worth of technology, but even if you don't, it's the essence of the art and the work and the, and the creativity in creating that experience. Um, it's, a, it's absolutely true, Andrew. Um, when, we, when we closed the, the, the New World Center on March the 12th, uh, the players themselves went to work. Um, and they said, we'll play from, from our common area, that all of them live in apartment complex, in an apartment complex, and there is this common room, large enough for a small ensemble. So off they went. We closed on a Thursday, nine days later, they were, actually eight days later, Friday evening, they were playing concerts at 7.30. They, they played their last one a week ago. Live from our living room is what they called it. It was one hour long. They talked before each one of the pieces that they played. And in each case, there was this chance to interact, simple as it is, mm -hmm. but they, they didn't hesitate. And the first two or three, they shot with their iPhones. We finally got them a, a better microphone and a better <laughs> camera. But I will tell you, it didn't make that much difference. Sometimes it's not about the production value of the of the of the transmission it's about what's coming from the heart of the player and is this were they effectively quarantined together then were they all in the same bubble oh yes yeah yes, i mean that's, a, that's you know you you read a lot about sort of this is an, a future idea do we need to quarantine the whole you know cast of a show or quarantine you know all of all of the you know all of the dancers of nutcracker but in this case because they all live in the same building or buildings yes. they were naturally already quarantined together and we're talking about how we will do that in the coming season. Yeah. Um, well, I, as I said, I've, I've seen a couple of them and they're fantastic. There are, you know, there've been a number of times in this talk and in our talks leading up to this, that it's very clear that the fellows um, are, are the artistic heart and soul of this operation. And, you know, you've meant, and the creative heart and soul, you've mentioned a number of these things that you've talked about have begun with their ideas or their thoughts and and you know with the programs that you talked about and even the fact that you call you know say that you're here to foster musicianship and leadership um, i wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about sort of the ethos around the fellows and, and how you how you think of them and how you work with them yeah this is this is um something that is deeply held here um michael uses the word colleague all the time day one of each season i always get a chance to say hello especially to the new players in the first sentence or two i use the word colleague for the first time and what develops over the course of the season is all of us working together colleagues in pursuit of sometimes that's a performance sometimes that's a connectivity inside the community Sometimes that's an online project. Sometimes that's fellows and donors, fellows and trustees. But in pursuit of an outward focused musical engagement. But the word colleague is at the, is at the heart because we are all together. It's fascinating to me to watch our players who in the early days, remember they're coming from an inward focused experience. They've been in a conservatory, they've been in a music school, they've worked hard five, six hours a day, uh, getting ready to practice and then practicing and then, and then reflecting on their progress on that given day, looking inside, you know, how can I be better? How can I make this more expressive? All of a sudden it's time to turn out. And in order to do that, it, help, it helps if you have colleagues to take you there. Mm -hmm. So in those early days, I watch our first years kind of struggle with this. They think they're supposed to keep just looking inside <laughs> and we don't give them much of a choice, but to look outside. And the result of that is ultimately a partnership, a colleagueship across the institution. And that, that applies to trustees as well as staff and fellows. And little by little by little, by the end of each year, we are a force. So it's, it's, the, it's the philosophy of who we are. It tracks back to, to Michael's understanding of inviting people to make music, but then out getting it out. Once the players come forward with their ideas, then you push out from there. And we've gotten very good at that. We spend a lot of time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked about this a bit when we were uh, when we were having conversations leading up to this, thinking about the fellows um, and thinking about the collegial relationship. 
um, and understanding that in, in you know really just in the last month or six weeks or eight weeks there's been a, a a new and extremely important spotlight that's been brought on systemic inequality and systemic racism in this country. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of where, where New World Symphony has been on that journey and what, what's changed since George Floyd and, and how the fellows have, have been involved in that journey. Yeah, this is, this is very important, Andrew. So, um, So slavery is the source of an enormous societal problem. And we're beginning to understand that in a new way. We all have a responsibility to counter racism. And we need to do it everywhere and often. At New World, since the murder of George Floyd, we have done our best to be humble and to be listening carefully. We put together uh, what one of our trustees calls a gathering. We called it a town hall, but a gathering may be the better word. It was staff and fellows and trustees, and we just let each other talk. My job, though, in that circumstance was to listen very carefully. And coming from that, we have formed a, an EDIB committee, and we will intensify the training that had just begun in back in October. Um, the most dramatic moment of this was one of the live from the living rooms when our fellows uh, dedicated a program to people who have lost their lives as a result of racism. And that's the most recent, most recent loss of life, not going all the way back to the lynchings of post-Civil War, but what's happening right now. Um, it's been a part of the conversation here at New World for quite some time. Um, dating back even to 1992, we took a look at it for the first time and actually wrote something down about what we understood the problems to be and how we might confront those problems. Um, we have a really strong partnership with Sphinx. Um, we've been bringing their, their winners here uh, as soloists with the orchestra. We've had their composers here. We're, in a comp we're actually in a composing consortium with them right now. Um, they also, the Sphinx Virtuosi, when they go on tour each year, their first concert is here at the New World Center. They come to Miami to prepare, rehearse for a week, and then they play their first performance here, ending at Carnegie uh, eight weeks later. Can, can um, you tell us a little bit more about Sphinx? About yeah, sure. So okay. Sphinx is is an organization that began as a competition. Aaron Dworkin founded Sphinx. Off of Dworkin, his wife, has taken over. Uh, the idea was that uh, and when he put it together, the idea was that if he could find players of color who would win competitions and then move out into the larger world, they would be an example for others. They would have vital, important, big time artistic careers, but also influence the world. Well, he did influence the world, but it was when he started saying, let me give you the facts. 1.5% um, of American orchestras are black and 2.5 are Latinx. So what will we do about that? We took that seriously. We began to rethink our, our audition process. We actually started recruiting. We hadn't recruited for a very long time. I'm talking about now six years ago. Um, we started recruiting. We made sure that players of color who wanted to, to take the audition for New World, they had access to do that. And the result of that, little by little, uh, over the last six years, we've gone from one or two, maybe three or four players of color in the fellowship now up to 15%. And we sort of ride around that 15% level, a little bit, a little above, a little below, but that's a significant number of players, we think, and it will, will continue. So it was, it was Aaron who challenged us and we have responded. What's also true is that with Mellon Foundation funding, we have Sphinx and the League of American Orchestras and New World engaged in two different projects. One is how you get ready to audition. We spend a great deal of time getting our players ready to audition. And when we have 20 and 23 and 24 and 25 victories each year where a player of, of a New World fellow uh, secures a job, that's in part because we have helped them get ready for the audition process. Now we're doing it with players that are chosen by the league and by Sphinx and by us, and we're running these, these audition training systems online now, no surprise, but it turns out that you can, instead of having 18 players here in Miami for that training, you can have 50 players. So the this business of access and, and how we push out, this is a big deal. So we train with the National 
Alliance for Audition Support. We also are working with young administrators through a program LEAD, leaders in, in uh, excellence, artistic, art, artistry, and diversity. Um, those are the managers, the next generation managers. So we're really, we're really proud of that. We have applied, we've done some convenings here at New World, educators, professional musicians, staff, fellows, uh, and trustees. And we've learned from that. We, from one of those convenings, we created something called the Bridge Plan, which takes you from your first lesson as a child all the way to being comfortable as an artist in the world. And there are five spans on that bridge. And if you're a player of color, a student of color, there's ways to make the transition and there's ways to not get to the next span of the bridge. So this has become a reference point for educators as, mm -hmm. as, they, as we push out into this territory. Very, very important work. We are committed. We're listening, we're doing our best. And, and when you had that convening right after uh, George Floyd and you were listening, what, what were you hearing from your, from your players of color? Tremendous amount of pain. Mm -hmm. Tremendous questioning of how to move forward. There was a, I don't know, I, I, maybe this is more me than them, but it's almost a paralysis. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't know what to do. And at that moment, all you could do was just sound off. Mm -hmm. um, we read a lot here, staff, mm -hmm. fellows, and board. We're big readers at New World. And if you dive down into this, I spent July the 4th rereading Toni Morrison, The Origin of Others, which I would recommend to anybody on this call. Our, our job now is to take that, that shock and, and um, just incredibly intense negative thing that happened as a result of the murder of George Floyd and turn it into action. Mm -hmm. So in the moment we listened, but it was the four, five, six days after that where I would sit and scribble in my journal and we would talk with each other and then you could start to sift and you could start to find your way. And we are still not there yet. I mean, we're making a plan and we're going slow and we're listening carefully to each other, but we got to turn all of that intense uh, energy and negative stuff into a solid plan and move. Yeah. So we're we're closing in on the final question. This is a question that I ask everyone. Um, in this moment in time, we're you know more than a hundred days into the COVID crisis now, which I can't even believe. Um, and still, obviously, we have to be looking at health and well-being and economic security and all of these really fundamental human. Uh, issues that we're dealing with. How in this moment can we say that symphony orchestras are important and matter? Hmm. Great question. So music has many purposes. Um, a march takes us to war, a lullaby puts us to sleep. Uh, we celebrate, um, we console each other with music. It's emotionally complex, it's intellectually intriguing, uh, it's revelatory. And when times are tough, when we're stuck, it helps us back away from the, the, the specific problem or whatever is plaguing us, and it gives us the moment to reflect and hopefully get to clarity. So that's the power of music. And we all know that, and we, sometimes let ourselves go there, um, but we need to be conscious of just how important this music is to ourselves. The second, in my mind, is that is that music builds community. We, we have had this confirmed over and over and over again. Most recently, the Knight Foundation, uh, incredible supporters of, of the New World Symphony, the Knight New Media Center, built by an endowment from Knight. But the Knight Foundation did a study, and what they've determined is that music coalesces. I think they use the word bind. It builds community. I know this from the Wallcast. 80% of the Wallcast audience, this is 2,000 people or more, 80% come to the wall in groups of five or more. 75% have never purchased a ticket to the New World Symphony. This is a second audience and they are coming together to be with each other. So when you walk the park before a concert, before a Wallcast, you hear this chatter and you hear them enjoying themselves as part of the South Florida community. Music comes, then it's time for the communal experience that is also an individual. 
transformation. So it does build com uh, community. But the last piece, I was thinking about this this morning. I woke up knowing that you and I would talk, and I was reminded of, of Ted Joya, who wrote this in, incredible book, uh, Music, the Subversive History. Um, and he talks about um, a discovery, the Paleolithic draw, uh, paintings in the caves of southern France. It turns out that those paintings are where in, in the most resonant part of the cave. Wow. And there are even in some places red marks that show you that if you stand there, that's the greatest resonance. The painters left the, 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 the paintings behind. The musicians couldn't do it, right? Yeah. But if you think about the gathering of force, the gathering, all of us coming together to be part of this musical moment, that dates back to the earliest of our kind, right? Yeah. And it tells us that this does have power. What's fascinating and what we've been talking about for 45 minutes is how that happens in person, in a, in, a, in a communal setting, and how it happens online. It's our job to make the most of our online connectivity, but where we're tracking back to is this business of, of bringing ourselves together and letting this music speak to us individually and also in the communal setting that gives it even more resonance and power. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. It was amazing and you know I, I was talking to my daughter over the weekend because like the rest of the world we all watched hamilton on disney plus over the weekend <laughs> you know she had memorized the uh the entire thing by listening to the recordings for years and but then hadn't listened to it for a couple of years and she told me that she remembered every single word and i said so do you do you remember any of your school work from three years ago and she said no not none of it and i think you know, it, it is the, the combination of the words and the music that make it sticky, right? The, the fact that she can she could say an entire, like she could have said the entire two and a half hour show from memory two years after thinking about it. It is, I agree. And I had never heard that about the resonance of the caves. And of course, now I'm going to go run and buy that book because that sounds fascinating. What's it called one more time? So the, it's called Music, A Subversive History. Subversive. Ted Joya is the author. He's a jazz player. Um, his brother Dana was head of the National Endowment for the Arts for a while. I know Dana just a little bit. I, I have yet to meet Ted, but I am going to do that because this <laughs> is a great book. But you can just imagine everybody coming together. I mean, yeah. we're not, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to, musicians are not going to find the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do our best to resolve the problems of racism, but that's a much bigger problem as well. What we will do is enliven the imaginations of a lot of people, some of whom will go find that vaccine, and many of whom hopefully will come together around the idea of community and help us get to a better place in terms of race. Well, thank you, Howard, for all of your time and insights. I um, feel like we've, we've traveled a thousand miles in 42 minutes here together. Um, but it's just so great to learn more about the wonderful work you're doing and, and uh, Maestro Tilson Thomas and all of the fellows there and all of your colleagues at the New World Symphony. So thank you for your time. Thank you. You're holding us together yeah. with that network. <laughs> we are. Yes. Thank you. Um, and if, if you can hang out for just one more minute, I will announce our next uh, innovator who will be joining us in two weeks. Uh, in two weeks, we will be joined by uh, Nancy Yao Masbach the president of the Museum of Chinese in America. Um, obviously a very relevant time for us to be talking about the Asian American experience in this country. So thank you again to Howard Herring, the president and CEO of the New World Symphony. Uh, I hope you were all well, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Howard. Take it easy.